Henrik Johansson. That's me. That's well pronounced. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a possibility of messing up names routinely. Yeah. People go for Weimerts with me quite often. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not to be confused with Weimert. Yeah. Or I get Weimart. Weimart. Also. What do Shop you get? There. Well, I actually appreciate it. At least people are trying, right? So I get Enrique sometimes. Fantastic. They figure I'm French. Yes. <laughs> or I get Heinrich, which, you know, well, German. Yes. But every time somebody does it, I'm like, yeah, I mean, you're trying. Yes. Yeah. So it's just Henrik. Um, and Johansson, I think it's close approximation to what you would say in Sweden. In Sweden, you actually say Johansson. Huh. But it sounds like you want some, so <laughs> I used to have it on my on my voicemails. Like, hi, this is Henrik. You want some? People uh -huh. are like, sure, Henrik. I want some. But <laughs> that's not why I called. <laughs> All right, so uh, we met through a mutual friend in town uh, who I'm a big fan of, yeah. uh, Jay. Me too. And uh, great guy, he is. And you have a, a pretty interesting background um, from an entre entrepreneurship perspective. But let's do the bullets here. So okay. 98 and I, there's a there's a through line here that I'm interested in, but 98 you raised 35 million. Yeah, not in one round, but for that first company, Credit Land and dot com days, we raised 35 million. Yeah. And that was to um, help banks issue credit cards online. Is that accurate? That was part of it. It was a broader vision that we were going to build a credit marketplace. OK, you know, it didn't exist at the time. You know, this were the early days of the internet. So our vision was that you pull one credit report and then we would have all types of lenders from auto lenders to mortgage lenders to personal loans to credit cards. And since we had, we were going to have all their decision criteria, we could an in instant optimize, you know, your loans. Mm. So if you had this much in a personal loan, this much money in mortgage, we can just say, no, you should move this here and you should cancel that card and move that over to this one. So that was the vision. And we, you know, we we built some really interesting technology. We we got some great partnerships. We even got Bank of America to share their full credit scoring criteria. And if you know anything about the, the banking world, that's like that's the secret sauce. That's they amazing, think, at least. Yeah. And we were, I think, the first to really approve credit cards online um, in you know ninety nine or something like that. Um, and so you know, it was going great. Um, it was a gazillion air and paper. Uh, my <laughs> wife and I, we we just moved. We'd moved up there a few years earlier, and we got married in two thousand. And you know, we had a huge wedding with opera singers and Cuban cigars, and my friends flying in from Sweden and all that stuff. That's amazing. And then, like six months later, the, the Lehman Brothers failed, and the whole no, sorry, that was another one. The, the dot com <laughs> crash happened. I've been through several recessions. Yes, so, yes. You know, I'm dating myself, but yeah, you know, and then the bottom fell out, and uh, the company unfortunately went under. And, had to fire 100 people and Brutal. start over. Yeah. So that was that was round one. That was round one. Round two uh, is Boundless. 04. Yeah, there was a small, small brief period of the company called Everyday Wealth in between uh, that actually brought me to Austin. They were also an online finance play. And I came down to run that for, for about a year and a half before I got the itch again to go stu do something myself. And that's that's when Boundless started. Yeah. OK. And so Boundless, again, th these are all the um, you raised for this also, right? Yeah. Got it. Done five venture funded companies to date. Interesting. Um, I want to talk about that. But yeah, the, I know you're bootstrapper. So. <laughs> I know. So there's a fundamental difference, I think, in yeah. both uh, um, obviously the financial side of things, but also the emotional side of things mm -hmm. and how you execute when it's your money versus somebody else's. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating to me. But so you raised for that one, Boundless. And what was the trajectory with that? Where did that go? Yeah. So Boundless, we raised, uh, I think, all in at the end was about $16 million. So we were a little uh, less spendy there. Uh, part of that was that uh, we only raised the first round in 2006. Um, and then, you know, the recession hit a couple years later. Yeah, so fun. we were we were a, a VC funded company, I'd say, for about three years, and then we we were a bootstrap company the rest <laughs> of the journey. Because uh, uh, yeah, we we were we were going to bring in another ten million dollars in VC funding, mm. and then uh, the markets changed again. This is when Lehman Brothers failed. And yes, markets changed overnight, and suddenly the VCs that you know kind of pushed you to to go 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 raise more raise more suddenly was not interested in funding it anymore. So then we had to grow up quickly and, uh, 
you know, cut costs and get profitable as quickly as possible. So that's what we did. And you did. Yeah, we did. We, yeah. we got through it. You know, we had to take pay cuts and, you know, fire a fair amount of people. I forget exactly what percentage it was, but it was pretty deep cut. You know, we had to cut to the cut below the fat, cut some muscle, not but not quite to the bone. And we were able to continue to operate and, and run the business. And then, you know, we turned profitable as quickly as we could and then continue to grow it from there, you know, and eventually grew it into a hundred million dollar business. Yeah, that's super interesting. So um, that, I mean, that actually speaks kind of directly to this notion of, and it's not quite the same, but the notion of um, VC backed versus bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. But the the delineation in that in that story is um, accelerating versus aiming for profitability. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Spending at, with a burn yeah. versus uh oh, we, yeah. we have to actually have a functional. I refer to it as a functional business model, yeah, yeah. right? One that makes money, yeah. um, which isn't really a fair assessment because I, there are a lot of business models out there that clearly are great for humanity, that they figure out profitability eventually. Mm -hmm. And the bet, the only way that they would get created is by really fast acceleration and a yeah. lot of money. Yeah. Um, I just have never done it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a high stakes gamble, right? And, and it's funny, we, we're having this conversation, we're sitting here in May of 2022, and a lot of founders are going through this now again, right now, mm. right? because the markets have shift have shifted pretty dramatically. Uh, you know, SaaS valuations, software as a service companies, public valuations. You know, used to be like twenty two times revenue, so now it's like ten, and it may go lower. So it's been this dramatic shift in the public markets. They're not coming into the private markets, so that you know a lot of companies that raised big rounds at billion dollar valuations, you know, unicorns. They're probably not going to be able to race at that level, even. You know, mm -hmm. they probably have down rounds, and you know, down rounds in the VC world is not a good thing to have. So, whole. I mean, if you think of it, we've had good days for the most part since the recession. It's been 12, 13 years of things going pretty darn well, and yes. the stock market up and to the right. So you have a whole new generation of investors too, you know, and and uh, founders that are learning what I learned the first time in 1998 or in 2000, you know, in the dot-com crash. Yeah. And then again, in 2008, 2009. What, um, from a, you know, from an operational perspective, uh, because that, this idea of, um, VC money ran out, I was getting more money to continue growth and run. And now I have to be profitable. Yeah, it doesn't. It, that story happens whether it's VC money mm -hmm. or just a shift in business, right? Or yeah. a shift in the economy, or you know, an ad campaign stops working, or w whatever. Yeah. Um, how did like what were the when you when you realized I'm not going to be able to raise any more money there? Mm -hmm. Where did you take it from there? From an operational perspective, right? From yeah. marketing, sales. <laughs> what were the things that you did where you thought, okay, I've got to change this right now? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's interesting too, right? Because it's a lot depend on where you are in that in that cycle, right? Mm. Because of, often as a VC funded company, you're you're not planning to be profitable any anytime soon, right? You're planning to go raise a Series A and then a Series B and then a Series C, and that's what the investors are wanting you to do too. So you you, you have this long trajectory, and you're investing in you know probably, probably typically these are technology based companies, so you're hiring a ton of engineers. They're not immediately producing any revenues. They're expensive resources, and you're investing a lot in building this technology. And you may be investing a ton in marketing that's not necessarily providing great ROI. You're building brand, and you're building partnerships and things like that. And you're not looking as much as overall profitability. You know, ideally, you have some good unit economics so that you know, yeah, if I sell it for fifty cents, I can, you know, I can make it for twenty-five cents, and. Uh, so that's actually, if it scales, you got to make money. There's some business model where, you know, you sell, sell a dollar for 90 cents and it doesn't matter how much you scale, that's never going to make any money. Right, right. And that was a lot of what's going on back in the dot-com days, I think, you know, nobody was thinking about that. So to, to get to your question, I think in my first company, Credit Land, in the dot-com crash, we were so far from profitability and the markets shifted so quickly that there was no way for us to, to fix it, right? Also, we're tied up in a bunch of partnerships so that even if we wanted to stop spending money, we had like a 12 month deal with Yahoo, you know, paying them, mm. let's say a couple hundred thousand dollars a month. We, we couldn't stop it because it was contractual and, you know, they were going through the same thing. So, so we just had too much, you know, built up 
future AP and, and just couldn't salvage it. So there we just had to file bankruptcy and move on. Uh, <clears throat> in the second one, we were closer. You know, we, we had real revenues. I think we were you know, generating 25, 30 million in revenues at the time. Mm. So there, it was a clear path. We did have engineers and we we're also building a platform, but, but we had real revenues that we could back it up with. So it just became a, a just became a, uh, <laughs> a matter of, right, let's reduce our costs, you know, sacrifice some of the long-term dream in order to get profitable fast. And then we'll just have to get to that long-term dream over time instead funded by ourselves. Got it. So you had a product that you were already selling, you already created revenue. You just had to scale back functionally product development. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah, that's intense though. And so what, uh, how big was the company um, when you sold it? Because ultimately you sold to Zazzle? Yeah, the company's right? called Zazzle in, in the Bay Area, uh, also venture funded by Kleiner Perkins. Um, at the time we were, uh, I think about 75 million in revenues, uh, about uh, you know, 100, 100 people employee wise. And then we had this network of resellers that we had a couple of hundred of those guys that were selling our, our platform and products to customers. So it's a team of close to 300 folks. Jesus, <laughs> it's my nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a lot of fun too. I mean, Boundless was, we built an amazing culture, you know, as a, as a, as a people, as a, as a place where people called home, right? Uh, often referred to as a family. Yeah. And we did a ton of fun stuff together. We went on, on trips together. We had an annual event called the Founders Event that we bought, brought in, you know, suppliers and, uh, our salespeople, our employees and customers. And it was really, really cool atmosphere. And we had a lot of people that built careers there, you know, that joined as an intern and ended up running a department 10 years later. Mm. So it was, you know, while, while what we did was not world changing in any way, what we, what we built as a company was really cool. Yeah, I love that. So that's, uh, you know, I, I say it somewhat in jest that it's my nightmare, but uh, <laughs> I think part of that is that I, when I think about um, managing 100 people or 300 people or 1,000 people or 100,000 people, yeah. uh, it seems like a horrible proposition because accountability, yeah. you know, pushing a rope, pick an analogy for yeah. that. But uh, ultimately, um, creating that community, creating uh, an environment where you actually want to spend time. Yeah. Uh, it sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'll tell you that it was just a few weeks back now there. So I left that company to, to start and run Gemba a couple of years ago. And they since got acquired again by a private equity group. Mm. Uh, so I went back to, to crash their, their founders event that, mm. I, that I mentioned earlier. And it was an amazing experience. I right? like there was probably a hundred people there and I probably uh, hugged 50 of them mm. and it was like, Oh, Henry, go, oh, Barry. <laughs> and uh, so th there was a lot of love there too, you know? So um, those relationships were real and I think will last a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, did you, uh, presumably the, the VC route you're building to sell yeah. all the time? Yeah. Um, did you have with and you, i guess this applies to any of them but did you have targets to sell to on creation of the company did you think hey i'm building it right now and here are the people i'm potentially going to sell to mm -hmm. yeah uh, and again that's where i probably have evolved a little over over the years that i think the first one we created it was like ipo or bust we thought it was mm. going to be like world changing sure without any other thoughts really much about it. <laughs>